message. Uh, the Lord gave the first thing the Lord gave me was the text and the title last week um, as we were praying and interceding. And I just, I, you know, it, not that I heard an audible voice, but you you feel it in, in your spirit. And I right away I was like, Lord, are you sure? Um, because this uh, this message today requires me to become. Uh, a little bit more vulnerable than what I'm used to, uh, and if you guys know me very well, I don't really, I don't share a lot of personal things of my life, uh, unless you're like family. Uh, but, uh, but yes, this is. Uh, I hope that the word blesses you today as it blessed me. All right, so we're gonna read uh, from the word in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32 it says, "And the Lord said, Simon, Simon." Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Amen. Let's, we're going to pray before the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, because I know that you, uh, have, that you are speaking uh, through intercession this morning, through worship this morning, Father God. And Lord, you're going to continue to speak through the message, Father. Lord, that every word that, pr that proceeds, that comes out of my mouth, Father God, that it be your words and not mine, Lord Jesus. Lord, and we, we glorify your name. We give you all the glory, all the the honor all the praise father and lord uh, give us uh, illumination give us uh, the knowledge open our hearts and our minds so we can receive the message this morning so we can receive the word this morning and lord uh, in your name in the name of jesus i rebuke every spirit of tiredness of slumber of anything that will block the message from re from being received by the people father god and even and although the, this message is also recorded lord i pray for those airways father i pray for those if for the internet father god that the enemy does not block we cast it down in the name of jesus so others can also hear this word this morning father god and lord i pray for the hearts this morning that it be open to receive your word in the name of jesus amen amen give god one more praise amen hallelujah glory to god the title of today's message is Faith Through Fire. And that was, that already, uh, the moment that the Lord gave that to me, I was, I, was like, Lord, are you sure? This is a very tough message. Again, it requires me to become very vulnerable with everyone, but, um, but that is the point. Uh, that is the point of this message, faith through fire. I will get back to the title and how it ties into the message uh, later on, but I just want you to keep that in mind, faith through fire. The main text that we read in Luke uh, 22, verses 31 and 32, it is only two verses, but it is impactful. It, it, it touched me in a way that I can't even express, I can't even explain, because it spoke to my life. And let me give you some foundation behind this text so we can get some context, okay? So up until this point, if you actually read the verses before that, I want to say even one, two, three verses before that, um, you'll see everything that leads up to that point when Jesus turns to Simon Peter and says uh, that Satan has asked for you, has asked to sift you. And if you actually go back to the beginning of that chapter even, and I encourage you to read it, it's powerful. Up until that point, Jesus initiated communion. How beautiful is that? To be the Last Supper. He initiated communion. He calls out his betrayer, Judas. Judas flees from the table. And then, right before for this passage he praises the disciples for staying with him and being by his side he even says if you actually look at the verse before that it says but you are those who have continued with me in my trials I will bestow upon you a kingdom just as my father bestowed upon me that what a beautiful blessing so they've had communion Judas is pointed out that he's gonna betray Jesus he flees they, they are promised this beautiful kingdom Kingdom. I will bestow a kingdom upon you just as my father bestowed upon me. However, at the end of all of that, to, I'm sure, Peter's shock, Jesus turns to him and then says these, these words, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you 
that he may sift you as wheat. That is hard to swallow because you're, you're going through this beautiful time with the Lord, it, probably his, his final hours with Jesus. And then he says this. So when we do a little bit of a word study, I am an English teacher by trade. I, it, that's my day job. Um, so I do a lot of word studies with my students so they can understand the meaning of certain words and why it's used in a sentence and why is it in that context so we can then extract the meaning. So we have the word, or rather the phrase to sift, because it's a verb, it's an action word. It's actually an agricultural term, and it means to separate, or really to shake. And it, it, during Bible times, whenever they would... Uh, sift wheat so they can separate because the whole point of sifting was to separate the fine part of the wheat the end product from the coarse part of it because you don't want the the coarse end you don't want that in your wheat you want just the fine wheat because then from there you can make so many other things uh and the reason why they had to sift it was for that but then uh i would say before machinery was invented before uh the sifting process w became easier for man uh, at this time, everything had to be done by hand. So I would imagine that this shaking couldn't be done nicely. It had to be done more violently and, and, and more with, you know, just with that strength. And not only that, uh, I was watching just to kind of educate myself on the sifting process. I, you know, YouTube is great. Watch some, I watched a few videos and I didn't realize that the sifting process was multiple siftings. Like you don't just sift it once you put whatever you've sifted back into that basket and you sift it again and then you take the remains of it put it back and you sift it again so it's a multiple time sifting so when jesus says peter simon peter they the satan has asked to sift you we're not talking about a regular problem or a regular situation or just a difficulty that one may encounter we're talking about the shaking of a lifetime and he's about to experience a shake a violent shaking that will make or break his life both physically and spiritually and it'll make or break his future ministry which is the spreading of the gospel and the building of the church so to this day, and, and, and if, if we go back to that first part of that verse, Satan has asked for you. To this day, Satan still, still in 2022, has to go before the Father to ask to sift the children of God. Now, and let, let's kind of separate ch children of God, right? Because those who belong to the world, Satan doesn't have to ask permission. He can just do whatever he wants. They belong to him. But why, you know, why the children of God? Because we don't belong to the world. If, if you are saved and uh, by the blood of Jesus and you have repented with a, with a honest and true heart and you are washed by the blood of Jesus, you belong to God. And so Satan cannot just do whatever he wants. He has to ask especially for those seasons of sifting, okay? So let's talk about that process, that sifting process. So how do we know that we are being sifted? Because it is very different from just a problem or something that happens. So I broke it down three different ways. The first way that we can kind of, you know, determine a sifting is that um, was this situation was the situation caused by you because usually problems many times I'm, i will be the first one to admit many times they're caused by ourselves due to bad choices and therefore we experience the well-deserved consequences that's not a sifting that is not a sifting okay so if you cause something to happen you made a bad choice and be like, oh lord i'm being sifted no 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 the i'm going through a season no, you're not. You caused it. You, this is the, these are the well-deserved consequences. But then you have a different type of situation. There are moments of di difficulty that are caused by 
other people, okay, who bring problems to your life, especially with family and close friends who definitely expect you to carry their cross for them along with yours and you're like, nope, that can't happen. Um, and then when you start feeling the burden and the heaviness of other people's issues, that is not a sifting. That means you need to put boundaries or like at least say, hey, th th I have to carry my cross, you carry yours. There's nothing wrong or unchristian about that, okay? Uh, that there's nothing wrong with telling someone these are the boundaries because you cannot carry the cross of many people, including yours. You'll fall over probably dead, okay? So that the, let's separate what's caused by ourselves and other people from what Jesus is calling a sifting. This is what a sifting really is. They are seasons of unexplained trials or tribulations, and they seem to occur without a cause nothing caused it nothing could nothing prepared you for it it's almost the phrase like it came out of nowhere or it's out of your control we usually don't know how long this process is going to take or how intense it can become just know that these attacks are definitely satanic in nature. It's all spiritual. And w the purpose is to attack three areas of your well-being. It's to attack your emotional well-being, your mental well-being, and your physical well-being. Well, let's add one more in there. Your spiritual well-being as well. So four. So this in turn affects everything else in your life because all of this is done with the intention to destroy your spiritual connection with God, your relationship with God. So again, let's separate if you know what we cause, problems that we cause versus these unexplained seasons where you're like where did this happen? How did where did this come from? So it all affects your prayer life your church life, okay, the, the affects your desire to congregate with one another, which, by the way, one of the most important things we need to do is to continue to congregate with one another. And the overall desire to seek the Lord, it affects those three areas, prayer, con uh, your, uh, uh, your church life, and your desire to seek the Lord. So for the children of God, those who are truly separated and washed by the blood of Jesus, these attacks are allowed by God. These, these seasons of, of sifting are allowed by God. And have you ever noticed, and this is kind of a rhetorical question, you can laugh at it, that's fine. Haven't you ever noticed that the, these like particular seasons always happen in an area that you're the weakest in in your life? all the time uh and we don't tend to think of like why can't it be in an area that you are strong in that you have strong faith and you're 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 on top of the world it, it, that's easy but then there are areas in our lives where we are weak and god allows certain things in those particular areas i want you to hang on to that thought for a moment about areas of weakness in our life so the reason why I mention this is because there are many instances in the Bible where a time of sifting has occurred. Satan had to ask God permission to cause that to happen. We're going to take the best example I could think of, and it's the life of Job. I'm not going to go through the entire life of Job. That is a complete <laughs> separate preaching, separate study all on its own. But just to give you a few verses to look at, Job chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. This is a prime example of Satan having to ask God permission to like, basically do his work in someone's life. It says, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That always makes me laugh because in this case, God brought it up. Uh, and then Satan had to ask, for, well, will you let me? How far can I go with this? So, but God brought it up and he brought it up for a specific purpose. Even Job had weaknesses in his life. Okay. Yes, he was a righteous man, but we're going to see that. He says, there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Uh, so we know that Job was a, a righteous man on the earth, but even the most righteous have areas of weakness. Okay. So Satan answered to the Lord or answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? In other words, he couldn't touch Job because of the way 
God had protected him around his household, around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So God does put parameters on those seasons of sifting. God puts limitations on Satan. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and did, and we all know how that went. He lost everything in just probably a several hours in just a span of a day, lost everything. So this is a prime example of Satan has limitations because God puts them there and God allows it for a certain reason. Now, Let's not think of like, oh, that's mean, that's terrible. Again, I want you to hold on to that thought of area of weakness in your life, okay? So not that God is mean, not that God is doing what, whatever. He wants to see us a certain way. No, that's not the point at all. Be- and the reason why we shouldn't think that way towards our Lord is because Jesus himself put himself through a time of sifting. Matthew 4, 1 says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil 40 days. Okay, so he went through the, in a physical body to experience it, what we would experience in a season, in a time of sifting. Even the master himself did that. And I thank God for that because he understands exactly what this feels like. See, our enemy is an accuser. He is eager to tarnish God's glory being displayed in our lives. And he will do all that he can to do exactly that, destroy all signs of his glory. Everything that is in us that, is, that reflects God, he wants to destroy that. But however, he must ask permission to do so. And many times, this is kind of the part where we're like, really? Many times, God will grant that permission. There are many times where he doesn't, where he says, no, you cannot. Because trust me, you, you don't think that Satan is up there asking for our lives, asking to kill us. And God goes, no, that, not that. And then it comes again. He doesn't fail. He comes again and again and again. And then when, a time, when the time is right, he'll be like, okay, you can do this. You have these limitations. This is your box, Satan. There you go. But God has a plan all on his own. See, we need to look at this from a different perspective. We always look at this as um, us going through it and like just the pain and the suffering in the moment. But we never stop to think, what does Satan see and what does God see? Let's look at the two different perspectives when this happens. And this is all mainly, I would say, foundational, understanding what this, like, what this sifting process is. So from Satan's perspective, this is what he sees. He sees God's potential in us. He senses, he doesn't know like quite what exactly it is or when it will happen, but he senses that God is getting ready to use us and take us to a higher level of service. And then he begins to view us as a major threat to the kingdom of darkness because he doesn't want the kingdom of God to expand in the world. And he wants to do anything he can to stop it. And then that's where he goes. He asks God for permission for a chance to sift us, to tempt us away from God's uh, purpose for us. And then when he, when he is granted that permission, he gives us all he's got, of course, within the parameters. And if you go back to Job, it was kind of a free for all, except don't touch his life. Okay. And sometimes that's how it is. It is a constant, uh, like, hit after hit, punch after punch. He throws everything he has at us. And then you know what he does? He sits back, not too far back, but he sits back and then closely watches our every response, our every move, everything we say. He hears all of that. He sends his agents to spy on us and to, you don't think that happens? Trust me, there it does. There is a spiritual world out there. It is a warfare. They're watching you. They're sur- they're, it's like a surveillance camera. They're watching your every move to see your response, to hear what you say, because your confession is everything during this time of testing. Praise God. Praise God. 
But let's look at it from God's perspective. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans, or I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord. Take this for yourself. He says, says the Lord, plans or thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. God already knows the plans he has for us. He, and on top of that, not only does he know the plans he has for us, he already defeated Satan. At the end of the day, Satan's defeated no matter what he does. He's defeated Satan. He knows he's already, that's the thing, he's already lined up the next season of our lives, but he knows that we need to be prepared for that next season. So then he allows Satan for a specific amount of time to sift us. And then he does the same thing that Satan does, waits and listens for a response. Because at the end of the day, we have free will. We can choose our response. We can choose to continue to go down the road that Satan wants us to and depart from the Lord, or we can choose to continue in the Lord. But then we have this big question. Why? Why does God allow this suffering? Why does God allow this? Why, why, why? You know, it, it's, it's very hard to stay away from that question. And a lot of times people do say it maliciously, like, why me? But there are moments where we're just like, oh, God, why? <laughs> like, why? Just out of desperation. And earlier I mentioned that when this violent shaking occurs, it tends to be in an area of weakness in our lives. So in, the, in an area that we have either like never been tested in before or maybe we've encountered some issues but not at this intensity before. So let's go back to the title of the message, Faith Through Fire. God is so good. He is so, so good because he gave us the answer to our question. Our question is why. Why does God allow the suffering to occur? And we can find that in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. And I want you to hang on to this answer. Next time you ever have that thought of why, this is the answer. This is the why. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. And not only that, this is Paul speaking, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Glory in tribulations means Be happy when you're going through trials, when you're going through suffering. Because knowing, you know that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. God is trying to build perseverance, God is trying to build character, and he's trying to build hope in that area of weakness. And the only way to do this is to put us through the fire. And Wednesdays, we, we've had many studies on this. For those of you that are here on Wednesday, how many times have we studied about being tried through the fire? And I'm going to remind you of some of these verses that we've studied. So that fire purifies. It gets rid of every impurity from metal substances. Job 23.10 says, but he knows the way I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold, reflective, re- like reflecting God at the end of it. Psalm 66.10 says, for you, you, oh God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. Zechariah 13, 9. I will bring the one third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And, w- and each one will say, the Lord is my God. Let me bring you to the New Testament the, fire, the, the mentioning of fire doesn't end there being tested through fire. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, Each one's work will become clear from the day, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Your works are revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And then finally, the last one I'm going to give you for this section is 1 Peter from Peter himself, later on, when he writes First, Second Peter, chapter 1, verses seven, 6 and 7. And this one I really want you to hang on, because this is after Peter's time of sifting. This is, his, this is after the fact, when, he's, when the church is already being built, when the church is already moving and working. In this you greatly rejoice, 
Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the why. God is trying to make you more into what you ever thought you could be. God is molding you and preparing you for the next season at that higher level of service because we have to reach a higher level because we have to reach the world. We have to expand the kingdom of God. We have to preach to the lost. And he's trying to build you to the man and woman that you are meant to be in him according to his purpose. So your true faith, your actual amount of faith that you have in that area that's being tested is only revealed by fire. And your works within are only revealed by fire. That's the only way. How else are we supposed to know where to improve and how to improve if we don't encounter something that is going to force us either in one direction or the other. But this is not the end. Jesus, Jesus is so good, he comforts Peter with his next uh, words after that. After he says that Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Pay attention to what he says. But I have prayed for you prayed past tense he already prayed for peter that your faith should not fail and it's interesting jesus didn't pray for satan not to sift him he didn't pray that he, it would be a little bit easier and it wouldn't be as difficult of a trial and not and not only that the lord didn't he didn't pray that god keep him from all suffering and pain during that that he he has to feel pain he has to suffer he has to go through all of this so none of that jesus pay attention jesus said jesus prayed that his faith would not fail during the process, that Peter's faith wouldn't leave him during the sifting process. And ultimately, because what's very dangerous is is when we're left with a life of faithlessness. Because then at that point, if we have no faith, we have no hope, we have no desire to even live. And that's where the enemy really really takes advantage because then you become his and he's able to he did exactly the response was exactly what he wanted from you and of course at this point in the preaching now maybe not everyone but some people i know i would if i were sitting down listening to this um some people think okay all right lynette all right i hear you i've heard this before but it's very different living it versus hearing it it's a whole it's a whole different process and i 100% agree with you i 100% agree with the statement it is different hearing it versus living it yes i hear it i agree but living it is a whole different struggle look i i've heard I've read, I've read the struggles of many powerful, like many mighty and powerful men and women of God in the Bible. I, I've heard of, of the struggles of others, and I always thought to myself, I, I'm, I feel like I'm someone of strong faith. I, you know, I, I believe for healing. I believe for restoration. I believe in all of these things, and as strong as my faith was in many other things, nothing. This is the part where I get a little bit vulnerable. Um, I, I've been trying really hard to make sure I don't cry. <laughs> so um, nothing could have ever prepared me or my husband for the last two years of violent shake after shake after shake after sift. Um, the last two years, I want to say, has been the hardest in our marriage. Sorry. Um, it tested my emotions. It tested um, the limitations of my body and uh, my mental health. Something that, you know, I don't, I don't downgrade, you know, a, a mental health or that people deal with depression, anxiety. That is a very real thing. Uh, that is something that we, we 
pray for that we can't because that's the enemy you know like that's a satan just putting all those things in your mind and i just didn't think it would be me so uh this is the part in the preaching where i specifically want to put in um uh, i don't uh I want to say, I'll say my testimony, even though my process of sifting is not over yet. Uh, don't get me wrong. I am still going through it. We are still going through it. But, um, but I want to share with you anyway, because there's power in that testimony. I, I want to share what I've learned so far, because th- these two verses have spoken to me like never before the last couple years of my life. So I'm going to throw a little bit of statistics, okay, because this is what man says, right? The world, they've done studies, and they, they do study after study, and if you look up any sort of t- statistics on anything that you're trying to look up, it's pretty easy. So did you know that one in eight, one in eight couples, uh, they have trouble conceiving? I never knew that. Um, I, I didn't think it was that common at all. Um, and our desire ever since we got married was to start a family and raise up a very strong family in the Lord, break all generational curses and just everything that has happened in both sides of our families in the past where the enemy has completely taken over. We wanted to break that once and for all and create a lineage of blessing, a lineage of powerful men and women of God teach our children the ways of the Lord and have warriors for Christ so they can expand the kingdom of God. And so we, of course, like, like, new, like newlyweds five years ago, young and in love and married and everything, we assumed that we would never have an issue. Like literally we would have conversations going, oh, when that time comes, we won't have any problems at all, never, because both sides of our family are quite fruitful. My, my, I mean, uh, my grandmother on my dad's side, she's one of, I think, like 11. My dad's one of eight. And like, they, they, I'm telling you, they pump out a village like crazy, you know, <laughs> one after another. So um, they created a little, a little community, a little village. Um, and I know my mom's side of the family is a little bit smaller, but never, never had any issues there. Um, and yet, and not that I know of, at least. And so we're kind of like analyzing analyzing both ends of our family going okay when the time comes when we're ready when we feel that we're ready it'll never be a problem we never expected that our season of sifting would be the sifting of infertility and I never knew how much I wanted to be part of the ministry of motherhood until the last two years it it ended up being a passion a, a fire that I couldn't control I, I maybe before I was like, okay, I want to be a mom, but the last two years I realized no, I want to be part of the ministry of mother, motherhood, the like like Sarah, like Hannah, like Rachel, like with with these powerful men and women of like God in their lineage that change the world. So, in the beginning. In the beginning, um, again, statistics tell you that if a year has gone by, then you have to seek medical consultation. So begrudgingly, uh, we did. And I, I say I, not so much my husband, uh, as wonderful as he is, but I mostly went through a time of physical testing. Because guess what? Uh, they don't do much testing on uh, males. They do a lot on the women. It's blood test after blood test, exam after exam, constant running after work to go to doctor's appointments, um, you know, filling out paperwork after paperwork, dealing with insurance, all that stuff. And that was, I remember specifically one test that I had to get, which was an ultrasound. Um, they had to do an ultrasound of the uterus. And that is painful. That is absolutely painful. And uh, I remember, I'm so glad that I called my mom to uh, come with me to the hospital to go get that procedure done because I couldn't, I couldn't lift myself off the floor afterwards. It was so, the, and of course the doctor always says, it's gonna feel like cramping. No, it does not. It does not at all. Like literally, like it does not. It was so painful. And I, and I try not to over-exaggerate because I, I have the tendency to over-exaggerate being Hispanic and all, but like I just, I literally could not walk after that procedure. And I 
was, I felt destroyed. I, I want to say that was the moment where I was just like, this is, is this what it is? Like, you know, and then of course I, you know, me, I get ahead of myself and I start thinking, what if this is not the last procedure I have to take? What if I have to go through more and more? And I, you know, I've heard of IUIs and IVF and the, how painful that is and the, how stressful that process is. So I was tested physically, like, until my body, I felt like my body couldn't take it anymore. Um, and then finally, we get the results, the, uh, the results that created lots of anxiety in us. And unfortunately, uh, the results weren't that favorable. Again, again, according to man, I'm not claiming any of this because the Lord is my healer. The Lord is my strength. Um, and, but this is what the doctor says, okay? This is what they state. Uh, they, they told us that we would probably not have a natural conception, but rather we have to have medical intervention for a chance at conceiving, for a chance. Um, yeah, that there was no way that it could be done uh, naturally because I only have one side working uh, and the other one is blocked. So it's kind of like a 50-50 shot and even then it's not so, mo so favorable. So when those results came in, then I wouldn't say that this is consecutive. It kind of all happens at the same time. The mental testing already started right before, like I want to say during all the exams. That's where the mental testing occurred because then you're trying to logically make sense of the situation. And by the way, we didn't even, we didn't even realize at this moment, well, we're talking like what, like a year or a little after a year in where we were trying to make logical sense of a spiritual problem. And we didn't realize, or rather, maybe we didn't want to see, that it was actually a spiritual problem. We, and so we're trying to put logic, man's logic, into a spiritual situation. So, of course, we're asking questions like, why can't my body function normally? What's going on? We're trying to come up with all of these reasons and all of these things to a spiritual season of testing. So then that's where I want to say the everything ramped up. I want to say um, over five months ago. I want to say like mm, I want like want to say almost a year ago. I would say six to six to eight months. Let's give it that. I'm trying to timeline it. The emotional toll, the emotional testing, was where the battle truly was, because um, I. You start dealing, you know, both of us, we started dealing with the constant feeling of disappointment month after month after month. You start feeling this deep, deep sadness and self-pity. And I'm about to say something next, so don't misinterpret me. Don't think I'm mean or don't think I'm wrong. Or, and if you do think I'm wrong, that's fine. But, like, I, I'm just telling you how it felt. It, it's really hard to force yourself to be happy for many other people who are experiencing that beautiful gift of bringing life into the world. And trust me, I never knew, I never thought I knew that many people in my life. I thought I had basically had no friends. Trust me, you start realizing how many people you know when you start going through a season and you're like, and you start noticing all these things. And it's, it was very hard to force myself to be happy to put on a smile here, even here at church, many, many of you probably up until a certain point, um, and which I will get to in a second, um, up until a certain point, many of you probably didn't even know unless you were close family. Um, I, we smile on the outside and we were on the verge of a mental breakdown at home. I, I cannot tell you, oh, I, w I wish I was making it up. I, I never knew what it was like to have a mental breakdown until you have one and um we hadn't and i'm not saying that our family wasn't there so please don't misinterpret me especially family that you're sitting here don't think that we didn't know that you're there for us and praying for us and loving on us trust me we we saw that and we felt it but it was still a very isolating experience it, it's and it's still it maybe not so much right now because this is where the I'm getting to the good part. Uh, the good part, this are, these are the dark times. Um, it was very isolating. We hated every moment of it. And then about five months ago, I experienced a true, like I want to say, 
I, I would say a, a, a definitely a mental breakdown. I came home from work. Uh, we have four wonderful cats, fed them, and I don't know. It, I, I still don't know what came over me. I, I guess I was already having a bad day, but it's just all the emotions because I'm so used to just holding everything I feel in. And I'm a teacher, so like I try not to show in front of my students how I'm feeling because I still got to get my job done. I still have to be with my kids and all that stuff. So just every emotion came out of me at once. And after the cats ate, I literally locked myself in the room and was on the floor having a, like just crying, Cry crying so hard, the kind of cry that you feel like you're going to be sick. And like, I was like near the bathroom in case I would get sick. And I remember just that moment that, that was, I would say that was my lowest point. And I remember calling mom not long after that because, oh, Satan is so sneaky. This is where, this is where God is like, hey, um, you've been over a year, like kind of like logically figuring this out. Um, this is where I started to kind of realize is there something else to this that I'm not seeing? Well, and of course, God's like, no, duh. You know, of course, there's something else to it. Um, so, and I, I called mom, and uh, she had been through anxiety and depression before, and when she was around my age, and um, and I called her and was like, I don't know what this is. I, I have an idea of what this is. This is how I'm feeling because I, I need you to kind of, you know, talk me, talk me out of it. Like just talk me through these emotions because I've never felt this before. And right away, mom's like, we're going to pray. We're going to rebuke the enemy because the Satan is not going to take a hold of my daughter in depression because the Satan is trying to use this to spiral you down into a family curse. Okay, this is a generational curse of anxiety and depression in my in the line of the women in my family and I was the next one and and yes my grandmother my mother have been delivered they they no longer have that praise the lord but that doesn't mean I am exempt from that doesn't mean that Satan just oh oops I couldn't uh, they're redeemed so I just forget about it. no I am next in line for that trial and so I, and right away we're praying and that is where Mom brings to my, my remembrance, she goes, remember what Jesus said to Simon Peter? Satan has asked to sift you, but I'm going to pray that I prayed that your faith doesn't fail you. He's like, pray to God that your faith doesn't leave you. Because I, I, I told her, I, I was honest, I was like, Mom, I have faith still, but it feels like this. Like, I feel it diminishing day after passing day it, it feel I feel this big and am I wrong am I in sin like what's happened she was no no just pray that your faith doesn't leave you because it's dangerous once your faith leaves you so after that conversation I just prayed I cried out to God I was like God just please don't let my faith leave me just like what you told Peter don't let it leave me. Don't let it fail me. And I ask that you don't allow it to happen. And although it's this big, just this big, like literally, it's how it felt. I could literally feel it. I felt like it was so small. And I was like, God, that you please just through this process, multiply it, please. You know, try like even if it's a little bit every day, I ask that you make it grow because I don't want to be like this anymore because we were at a year and a half at that point, just constant without, without any break, without any emotional, mental, physical break. And so we go back to that. We notice that Jesus didn't say, and this is where we get to that part of the verse. He didn't say, Peter, I pray that you have great faith. Or I pray that you have so much faith to get you through this trial. No, Jesus just solely prayed that his faith wouldn't fail him through the trial. What I'm going to say next, please do not misinterpret me. Please do not misunderstand what I'm about to say because I am a person that believes that you have to have great faith. OK, I, I let's get that. Let's get that clear. As of right now, you need to have great faith and believe in Jesus and believe in his power, believe in his healing. And but here's the thing. Let's be honest. Not every trial is the same and not and our level of faith 
is not the same at the start of that trial. Okay, so it, it's true. Like, we think that we have to approach this with, oh, I need to have so much faith. And if you don't, you're wrong or like something is going on. And, you know, it's like, no, like at the start of the trial, your faith is not the same size as many as probably other areas of your life. And sometimes for certain things, we actually have a small amount of faith. We just didn't know it because we weren't tested in that area. Again, I always thought I'm a person of pretty good faith, I feel. You know, I feel I believe in healing and restoration and salvation for the world. But yet when this season happened, I realized how little faith I had for myself, how little faith I had for the situation. So let's go to Matthew 17, 20, because I believe this will bless you the way it has blessed me, especially when I was at my lowest point. Matthew 17, 20 says, So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So even if your faith is this big at the moment, God can still move mountains. There's still nothing impossible at all. So I give God glory. I give God all the praise that my faith didn't leave me. Because even if it was this big, like a mustard seed, it still is powerful. But here's the here's a rhetorical question. Does that mean that we stay with that same amount of faith? Absolutely. That's a huge no. Absolutely not. Because we go back to the why. Why are we being tested? Why are we going through this suffering? We are going through this because God has a new level of our of our service to him ready. And we need to be prepared for that service because we go back to Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, that we need to glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces what? Perseverance, and that perseverance produces character, and character, hope. So in this next season, whatever God has planned for not just our lives, but the lives of our children, our future lineage, we need to have character. We need to, there's something that God had to build in us and grow in us for we can be ready to go into that next season of our lives. So we, I pray, I pray all the time, God, increase your faith, my faith and my hope. So I pray that for you today, this morning, that God increases your faith and your hope, whatever you're going through. So there was a moment um, where we definitely sat down together where we start talking about, okay, let's look at some patterns. What's going on here? This is kind of out of nowhere. It's unexplained. Um, it's just not wasn't caused by anything there's nothing physically i could do i can't exercise my way to an um to you know according to man according to what the doctor says i can't exercise my way out of it or eat healthy my way out of it this is just biologically something that has occurred and it's out of our control so once we realized that this was very demonic and spiritual in uh, attack like in nature uh we understood what god was trying to create and mold in us through the process we started seeing it through the fire we were being revealed all of the areas of our life that needed to improve and one big one was our perspective okay like the the way we see certain things i'll get to back to that in a second and because we were we were at that point um, over a year and a half of just living in the uh, on the bus of self pity, and that's not that's not for you. God doesn't not, God does not command that you live in self pity. God in, not at all. So that's where we were. But the, I want to say the the one thing that had to change in our lives that we didn't re realize before was a change in our prayer life. Because not saying we didn't pray, we we do. We uh, every night we pray together. We meditate daily on the Lord. Even when I'm at work, just Lord, you know, bless the bless the children, you know, and you know uh, that even if they don't know you, that they see you through me. Um, and so it, we had to change our prayer life. We had to go from weak prayer to powerful prayer to prayer of 
actually fire and war because this was a war we were fighting this was some we were trying to fight a demonic war and a demonic attack with a very quiet lovely beautiful nice sounding prayer it got to the point where we would now we especially in the beginning we shut ourselves in our office and we were just you know yelling at satan and, and casting him out and and breaking every curse and every demon every devil that was coming against us uh, barrenness we were attacking that we were attacking you know just curses in our family line and just understanding that what was happening and so we had to change our prayer to prayers of fire and war and at that moment once we kind of realized what was happening that's where that's where god answered my prayer about my faith because my faith is not the same anymore it's not small like it once was and then also going back to changing our perspective before i get to that uh we had a we said it was like we sat down and we're like okay even though we didn't cause this okay why why is this happening okay we changed our prayer we changed our you know whatever then we kind of backtracked to what two years ago and we're like, did we do anything two years ago? Like to kind of like, you know, uh, you know, it, just out of curiosity, like we're trying, you're trying to think timeline, like, what did I say? What did I do? Like, where can I adjust? And so we realized that this wasn't a coincidence to the point where we kind of laughed, like, but the kind of laugh, like, huh? Like, oh, that's what it is. Um, before the whole sifting season began in our lives, we, I remember a special prayer we prayed. And we talked about it. We're like, wait a second. Two years ago, what did we pray for when we, two years ago when we started like, hey, let's start a family. And before that we prayed and we prayed that we renounced every curse of Satan, alcoholism, depression, anxiety, all the family curses in the, in the family, we renounced them. And we uh, brought down every stronghold on both sides. We claimed our future lineage for the Lord. We, I remember we prayed a special prayer that, Lord, you're going to bless our family. You're going to bless our lineage, our children, our grandchildren for many generations to come. They will build the church. They will be prophets. They will be preachers. They will be teachers. They will be evangelists. They'll be worshipers for you. They're going to go travel the world for you. And that's where we're like, wait a second. Isn't that what we did two years ago? Oh, okay. So it all it all started making sense. So that's where God answered my prayer about my faith. God started, he increased my faith. I have so much faith right now. It's not even funny. Like I, I'm a completely different person. My speech is very different. Uh, when I confess, as I say, your confession during the time is so important because your confession can make or break you during that time. So my confession had to change. I went from, you know, from feeling sorry for myself to just understanding what God's trying to do through me and for me during this time and he started speaking to us through his word we were just receiving word after word opening the bible and then you know someone would be someone would send me like hey I was thinking about you here is a you know here is a you know a, a chapter that I want you to read and the first and I remember reading it, it's from Isaiah the first line is oh barren woman rejoice because your tents will expand and everything and I was like oh praise God and uh, you know just you know and I'm like oh praise God for that God was speaking to us through his word for those of you that were here spoke to us through a complete stranger and we were like wow like that's where my faith just really started to catapult uh, into the air and um and then finally uh he was speaking to us through dreams and we're not big dreamers but you know what if you need it you're supposed to dream because God communicates through dreams while you're sleeping so uh pray to God that you know that everything every blockage be removed so he can speak to you and so he was speaking to us through dreams and uh, to make a long long one short um this was recent i want to say what about a month ago something like that around there um i had a dream that uh i walk out of my bedroom and i see construction workers knocking down the wall to our bedroom and i look over in the dream i look over to david and i go david what is happening like did you hire construction workers like we don't have we don't have the money the budget for this like what's happening like why are they why are they here he goes oh they're expanding the house they're expanding the bedroom and i'm like 
but why? And so like, I'm, of course, in the, yeah, I'm oblivious, but the point is that God is confirming the expansion. Confirm Because remember, the enemy won't give you a dream about expanding. He'll give you a dream of regression, of, of being tiny, of small, of going backwards. This was a dr- of expanding our home. And I just thank God because it wasn't until that realization, that moment where I had to, and I had to go before God and be like, God, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. I repent for my attitude during this time and my my emo- lord deal with my emotions deal with my mental health deal with everything and that is where the faith increased so um from now from that moment on from about five months ago till now all we do is declare healing in both of our bodies we renounce every malfunction in our bodies we declare fruitfulness in the name of jesus we renounce barrenness in the name of jesus and even and here's the thing and even if i if we have to go through treatment even if that needs to happen you know what man says more statistics for you because I'm, I'm crazy like that. And I like to look up my chances, right? Like what does man say my chances are? Man says that because there's two different kinds of treatment. There's what's called an IUI, which is insemination. So you, you go to the doctor and they basically like just put, put, every, put the fertilization in you basically. Um, and then you, every, mostly everyone knows about IVF, which is way more invasive because it requires surgery on my end. It requires surgery because they have to actually extract eggs and all that stuff and do it, it like actually fertilize in a lab and then go through the implantation process. So the first one, the IUI, is much less invasive, no surgery necessary. But even for that, because that's step one, even for that, man says it takes on average, three rounds of treatment, sometimes four, to maybe conceive. And once you start heading into the five and six and nothing happens, then you go to IVF, which is very expensive and much more invasive, requires surgery. And my declar- our declaration is even if we have to go through treatment, let you know, and not even like whenever that happens, even if we have to go through treatment, God can still work through that treatment. God can still work through that. You know why? Because statistics say three times, but my God can say, I'm going to do it on the first time. I'm going to surprise all the doctors and do it the first time. Because according to them, that's nearly impossible. They usually the first time is kind of like to see what happens and maybe you might get lucky, but that's quite rare. She was like, what the chances are like what less than 10 percent maybe to get it on the first time but no i believe that my god is so great and so powerful and so real he'll do it the first time and marvel everyone because failure is not our portion we were not meant to fail and it is not yours either you are not meant to fail through this so whatever sifting process you may find yourself going through today just know that you are not meant to fail that you were meant to grow you were meant to prosper remember per, you're building perseverance and perseverance you're building character and character you're building hope and God opened my eyes and showed me how he is using this to make me make us as a couple grow so instead of focusing on the actual battle itself because now our focus has changed. We're not focused on the battle. We're not focused on the attack. Yes, we renounce it. Yes, we attack back. But we're not focused on the battle itself because Satan is already defeated. Satan's already done. He's just trying to throw cheap shots at us at this point because he may know something we don't know about our own children, about our grandchildren, because, you know, Satan's going to try to stop the lineage, and that's not going to happen. He's been defeated. So I am, I am being called, we are being called to not focus so much on the battle. Yes, we attack when the attack is well necessary, but we are called to focus on praising him, on thanking him, and worshiping him for the promise that is to come, for the next season that is to come, for that next level of of service for that ministry in your life for that prosperity in your life because maybe right now God's building that character so you can handle that prosperity in the next season of your life so you see our role in all of this is to glorify the king of kings and the lord of lords because sifting seasons are meant to be strengthening seasons so while the enemy sees it as a opportunity to stray you away from god's purpose which unfortunately he succeeds sometimes but 
the whole purpose. He tries, he tries to separate us from our faith, but God uses it to separate us from our fears and to separate us from living a life of little faith in that area. So he uses it to strengthen us, to refine us, and to purify us. But I'm not done yet because there's more. There's one more. Because we're not done with those beautiful two verses where he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And he says, but I pray for you that your, fa- that your faith doesn't fail you. He ends with the most beautiful thing. He says, and when you have returned, when you're done, when, uh, when all is done, return to me, strengthen your brethren. This is so powerful because God is, I I take it for me too, not just Peter. I know Jesus is specifically talking to Peter, but the word of God is breathing and living and real and it's for us. So I look at this and go, God, God is saying, Lynette, when you are done, David, when you are done, return and strengthen your brethren. This is powerful because he's, he's tasking us with the, with the duty, with the, uh, the, uh, the qualifications to strengthen our brothers and sisters in the faith that need support because there are many others even within our even within the church that are very have very little faith so we have to strengthen one another and let's take it further let's get out of the walls of the church let's strengthen the people that and use our testimony our qualifications to other people who don't know the lord and bring them to the kingdom of god and bring them to the knowledge and love of Jesus because it is through our testimony that brings people to the Lord it is through the healing power in our lives that brings them to the Lord and sometimes there are many people that don't have faith that they are faithless and we have to stir up that fire and and ask the Lord Lord work in the in the lives of these people and how else are they supposed to know the power of God if we don't share it so Jesus tasked Peter when you are done don't just keep going you have to come back and strengthen your brethren. So our ultimate purpose is our testimony. What Satan set out for you, for me, for all of us as a mental and emotional destruction, God allowed it for his glory. And whenever Satan has thrown, whatever he's thrown at you, because he, only you can analyze your life and know whether the problems you have are caused by yourself or other people or are they truly times seasons of shaking of violent sifting so whatever satan has thrown at you in your life it was initially for your ultimate demise it was initially for your destruction and hey he wants us dead that's what he wants. That is the, uh, he wants to stray you away from the Lord, get, him, uh, get you without hope, without faith, without nothing, then to ultimately, you think he's going to keep you alive very long? No, he's going to kill you. He's going to destroy you because then you, at that point, you are his and completely his forever and all eternity. So that is the plan. So whatever he has, know that's the plan to diminish your faith to, for your demise. But you know what I say today? You know what I say and proclaim today over your life? I cast that down in the name of Jesus. Let's attack the en- attack him with a vengeance because this time of sifting is not for Satan's glory. It is for God's glory. It is not for him to get a hold of your mental health. It is not for him to get a hold of your emotions and stray you away and put you in a dark place that you can't come back from. It is to build a testimony to bring others to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So I tell you today, stand strong in the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Amen. Know that your perseverance produces character and your character produces hope. And he has, I, I pray that the Lord strengthens you the way he has strengthened us because I am a very different person standing up here before you than I was five, six, seven months ago, a year ago. And although like many didn't know it, but that's what was happening. That's what was going on behind closed doors. But he has strengthened us because the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I pray, just like Jesus prayed for Peter, I pray that whatever you're going through, if you're going through anything, I pray that your faith, even if it's this big, 
even if it's this big, I pray that it doesn't fail you, that it doesn't leave you, and that even with that faith like a mustard seed, that it moves mountains in the name of Jesus. And I pray that it grows and that you grow character, that you grow your hope and your faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for, to praise the Lord. Let's-